Welcome. This is the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. This is where you'll learn strategies to help you achieve lifetime financial freedom through real estate investment. Your host, Rod Cleef, has owned over 2,000 homes and apartments. And he brings experts in all aspects of real estate investment and management onto the show. Now, here's your host, Rod Cleef. Welcome to another edition of How to Build Lifetime Cash Flow Through Real Estate Investing. I'm Rod Cleef, and I'm thrilled you're here. And I know you're going to get a ton of value from the gentleman we're interviewing today. Uh, he's got a lot to offer, and I'm very excited to get into that interview. But before we do that, I want to mention a couple of quick things. One is, I am all over social media, and if you are as well, please connect with me. I love interacting with you guys. And, you know, I'm on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram. Connect with me. I'd love, love to connect with you guys. And also, I love hearing your stories. If you've purchased a multifamily property or, you know, any multifamily based on some of what you've heard on my show, I'd really love to hear from you. Give me that gift. Email me at rod. rod rodcleef.com and, and share your story with me. And last but not least, I still have not put my book on Amazon. I promise you it's going there, but you can still get it for free. All you have to do is text ROD to 41411 and I'll give you a free copy, 200 pages long. I've had rave reviews on it. Please take me up on that offer if you haven't because uh, I know it'll add value to you. Our guest today, his name is Paul Moore. Paul has, he's got an MBA from Ohio State. He started out at Ford Motor Company and then started a staffing company. And I mean, he's a guy He's done a lot. I could go on and on here. He's flipped houses. He's built houses. He's built subdivisions. You know, I'm going to let him tell you his story. Paul, I'm, I'm thrilled you're here, buddy. Oh, it's great to be here. Thanks, Rod. Absolutely. So you tell us, in your words, your real estate story. You know, how you got started and where you are now and some highlights in between. Okay, great. Well, like you said, I have an engineering degree and then I got an MBA from the Ohio State University, went to Ford Motor Company and really enjoyed it there. I was at the uh, headquarters in uh, Detroit. But uh, after a couple months, I started looking for entrepreneurial opportunities on the side. You know, I wanted to build an oil chain shop or start a tax <laughs> consulting firm or something like that. And I just realized, you know, I'm really an entrepreneur at heart. So about four and a half years into that, in the uh, late 90s, uh, I started a staffing company uh, and my partner and I were able to uh, grow that quite substantially. I was finalist for Michigan Entrepreneur of the Year two years in a row. Oh, cool. And then, yeah. And then we sold that in 1997 for uh, about $2.9 million. Nice. And I ended up Which in Which was a lot of money in 97. Yeah, it really was, and, and especially considering you know we I mean we were only making a couple hundred thousand a year, so the the you know the the multiple on that basically we sold to a publicly traded company who had more money than sense to be honest, wow. and uh, but anyway, awesome. um, great people, and it, it was a great it was a great fun ride. But I, I was trying to decide: do I want to stay a mile and a half from the city limits of Detroit while it's imploding, or do I want to move to 120 acres on top of a mountain in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia? And I had two that's young tough. children. Oh, that's story. That's a story. It was that tough, yeah. tough decision. <laughs> but anyway, we did end up moving to uh, Virginia, and we started an international student nonprofit organization where we were trying to basically, and we were inviting people from different colleges in this part of the country, uh, international students, to come spend a weekend on a ranch and uh, ride a horse and milk a cow and uh, oh, fish cool a pond. Is that? Wow, I didn't, know, I didn't know that about you. That is fantastic. Good for you. Well, you know, Rod, 85% of international students who come to the U.S. and spend an average of five and a half years here never <coughs> set foot in an American's home. And one of their goals is to get to know American culture. So we just thought it would be great to provide a, you know, like a three or four day weekend for these students and get a chance to live with Americans and enjoy life. And we did that. And, and frankly, it was great. We had a lot of fun. Uh, but I was in my mid 30s and very driven type A sure. entrepreneur. And, you know, going into semi retirement in your mid 30s sounds fun, but it was miserable. Hmm. And um, I couldn't do it, so that's right. how I got into real estate. I, we started flipping houses, and where, where, by the way? Well, we started in the burgeoning metropolis of Martinsville, Virginia. We were like an hour from Roanoke, and uh, hmm. we uh, we made twenty four thousand dollars in a couple days on flipping our first house. We thought we were off to the races, but then we found out reality 
set in, and that was, wasn't was the case. Was Reality 2007, or was, was it had before? No, it was 2001, okay. but Reality was the unemployment rate in Martinsville was 22%. And uh, uh, guys, the- guys, those of you listening, that's a clue. Okay, that's what we call a clue. <laughs> All right, you know, in my book, we talk, I talk about where what markets to invest in. You know, the four markets you should you should look at first, and then what to look at in each of those four markets, and that would be a big clue to stay out of that market. Right. But anyway, sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to twist the no, knife there. Great. I just thought I'd share it with my listeners. Oh no, I love it because that's one of the things we are really big on. It's market selection now in my business. So, um, but that's great. We, so we moved to Roanoke pretty quickly, and we flipped sixty or seventy houses at Roanoke, Smith Mountain Lake, in that region, and we got into modular homes. Like you said, we built oh, a subdivision. So did I. No kidding. You did it. So you your subdivision was modular. Uh, actually, the the subdivision itself was not modular, but oh. I got. And I, I did build a number of modular homes in wow. other subdivisions at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia. Yeah. Um, I set up a real estate portal. Uh, we have seven realtors that still uh, get leads from this today. We basically just feed Google AdWords and uh, Facebook ads, and we generate thousands of leads a year, and these realtors run with these. And uh, basically, I spend about an hour a month on that. So that's some really pretty good passive income. Oh, that's there. cool. So that's a side business for you, uh, uh, providing leads for realtors. Right. Yeah, we oh, just cool. do it here. I've tried it in like three other locations, and it's never worked. So smithmountainhomes.com is that website. But hmm. um, anyway, um, we... I ended up investing in oil and gas in North Dakota, and even though I have a petroleum engineering degree, I shouldn't have invested in oil and gas. Let me tell you. Really? And, uh, yeah, it's it was uh, the the Bakken oil boom was on, the rush was on, but my partner and I realized every time we flew there, we couldn't find a place to stay. There were people staying in their pickup trucks. This uh, is this is for the, the, the shale boom. I, I heard about that. I mean, you you there were phenomenal opportunities, but and and people made a ton of money up there. But then now recently. I, I think uh, a lot of people are hurting because, you know, it's slowed down so much. Is that accurate? Oh, it's absolutely accurate. Uh, I can tell you that people were sleeping in their pickup trucks and, uh, you know, rest stops. And uh, uh, it was a really bad situation, you know, 50 below zero in, in the winter there. So this was around 2010. So we, my, my partner and I were in, already in real estate, and we had built a, uh, a really nice office building in Colorado Springs. He, he was, mainly did that. I invested in it. And we decided to build a multifamily facility. We built a really nice multifamily facility near Williston, North Dakota. Hmm. And yeah, Rod, in the heart of it. Yeah. And you know, rents typically, in a lot of America, if you measure by the dollar per square foot, they would run, you know, ninety cents to a dollar fifty a square foot. In other words, a thousand square foot apartment might go for yeah a thousand dollars a month in a typical market, right? That's average, yeah. Yeah. Well, we were charging thirteen times that. Wow. Thirteen dollars a square foot. We were charging uh, thirty nine hundred dollars for a three hundred square foot <laughs> uh, unit, and they were we were full all the wow. time. Wow. Wow. So you were one of those guys. Wow. Good for you. That's, yeah. That's that's, that's, that's unbelievable. Good for you. That, yeah, that gave me a taste for multifamily. We sold that at the height of the boom, made oh, a couple yeah. million dollars. Fantastic. And we were smart enough to plow it into a really high-end Hyatt hotel that we built, and that did not go so well. That was actually in a different part of North Dakota, but it was still impacted by the oil boom. And so, you know, uh, mm. learned a lot of lessons with that. You know, there's there's a there's a couple of themes here, and and believe me, I have this memo as well. I've had 18 businesses, and some have been incredible successes, and many have been spectacular failures. It seemed like every time I got out of real estate, I would get my my butt handed to me. I, I, there's a theme here with you, buddy. It's the you know the whole entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs love the shiny penny. You know the shiny penny syndrome when there's something exciting or head turn. Although it's a, I love it. I wouldn't give it up for anything. I love being an entrepreneur, but that is the risk. You have to you have to say no, particularly. You know, like, and I and I noticed, and, and you talked about oil and gas, and then you talked about a hotel, and and then you've had some success, some fantastic successes, and it's so easy. In, in my case, I won't speak for you, and but you you just think, you know, when you're when you're a huge success at, in one particular area, you think you can replicate it everywhere. Sometimes the universe or God or whatever has a, <laughs> teaches you a lesson that you know to stick with what you know. You've done it all. I mean, from an engineering degree to real estate to staffing to hotel business to I mean what what do you love what if you were to if you were to step back from yourself for a minute what do you absolutely love doing well I um 
I didn't tell you about how I went from $1.9 million in the bank to $2.5 million in debt in 07. I'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, no, no, actually, we could go there first. We could go there first, <laughs> okay. and we could hold my question until after that. Let's do that. Let's talk okay. about that first. Well, we, we started, we were doing modular homes. Uh, we, we bought a five-acre tract that we were going to subdivide into five one-acre lots. And these were lots that had been purchased originally for five or $10,000, maybe $50,000 in the 70s or 80s. And now they were worth four four, five, six, eight hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars. These are nice waterfront lots. Uh, we have people coming from your area actually yeah, that's so investing. Funny. There. I, I did the exact same thing. Waterfront lots, I put modular homes on them. I want to hear your story, and then I'll tell you mine. Go ahead. Keep going. Uh, well, we had about 10 waterfront lots, and we were making about $100,000 profit per <laughs> lot. We were clearing the brush. We were getting a dot permit, maybe adding riprap on the shoreline, putting a beautiful sign and great advertising. We had a beautiful website and we were making about $100,000 a lot. We did this about 20 times and we had about 10 lots when I saw the headline of the 2005 Fortune magazine and Rod, I don't know if you remember it, it said, the real estate bubble is about to burst. And you know, I was busy playing in South Beach then to my peril. That was that was, I had moved to Miami and wasn't paying attention, you know. I thought 80 million baby boomers getting old and getting cold, we're not going to we're going to keep Florida afloat forever. Uh, shame on me. That was where I dropped the ball. So no, I missed that magazine cover. So I, I probably had I had I seen it, I probably would have ignored it anyway because you know, like I said, you get a big head and you think I tell the story, my real estate went up 17 million dollars in 06 and do the math on that and how much it is per hour and and I thought I could do no wrong. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So so anyway, you were you were you were doing these lots. So what went wrong there? Was it the, was it the, the timing again? Well, um, there was a couple things. First of all, the timing. We were holding about ten lots, you know, for several hundred thousand dollars each. In some cases, uh, when the market turned, and we also assumed that the five-acre uh, lot would be subdividable, that the county would allow us to do that real soon based on the information that we had. Uh, well, that was not the case. So that alone was about $860,000 in debt. And, in, you know, when I saw that Fortune magazine headline, I wish I would have listened to Paul Simon and, and Garfunkel, the, the song, you know, the boxer, it said, a man hears what he wants to hear and disregards the rest. And I think like you, uh, I wanted to not believe that, and um, but so we we bought a few more lots after that. Then we start to, saw the market start to slow down, and so I found myself my partner in late 2007 said I can't make these interest payments anymore. We're, we were two and a half million dollars in debt. I'm, I'm going to bail in two more months if we, nothing changes. And um, he bailed, and, and we're still friends today. He still works for me and my uh, other real, residential real estate company, but. Uh, I found myself with these huge interest payments, my back against the wall. And one morning, I, I, I tried to have a morning time of meditation and prayer. And one morning, I I thought, what would George Mueller do? Now, George Mueller is one of my heroes. And I know you have the Tiny Hands Foundation. You would love this guy. He lived from about 1810 to 1898 in uh, Bristol, England. And he housed thousands of orphans. Wow. And he did it all. He raised, uh, in today's dollars, I think he raised close to $200 million, and he never asked anybody for a penny. He was doing this to demonstrate that uh, the law of uh, sowing and reaping, giving and receiving, uh, karma, whatever you want to call it, he, he basically trusted God to bring all the money he needed to build these orphanages. And those are still there today, the, or the wow. buildings are at least. But they had some really unusual situations, like where they were sitting around at breakfast and with the plates in front of them, dressed for breakfast, you know, hundreds of orphans, and there would be no food. And they would get a knock on the door, and the milk truck broke down outside, you know. Yep. Or uh, a baker came to the door and said, I woke up at 2 a.m., and I couldn't sleep, so I baked you a whole bunch of bread. I mean, that happened That over is over. so cool. And I, I, gotta, I have to interject, the exact same thing happened to me with the Tiny Hands Foundation. In really? Fact, what it happened? Was, it was like 08 or 09, height of the crash. You know, I had paid... For those of you that don't know the story, um, you know, I started the Tiny Hands Foundation in 2000. I fed five families. And, you know, one of the families, and I don't think I've ever really gotten into it on this podcast. I've been interviewed and talked about it. But, uh, you know, one of the one of the families was this woman with five kids. And she, she, she um, 
stepped out of the house. She saw the food. You know, we do these big baskets of food with gifts. And she started crying when she saw the food. And then her five kids came out, and they all started crying when they saw the food. And then I started crying. And, I mean, I was hooked. And so every year... I, I, I fed families. I fed 50 the next year, and then I doubled it every year, and I paid for it. I, 50 families, then 100, then 200, then 400, then 800, then 1,600 in like 06. I fed 1,600 families, and I never asked for money. But then, of course, 07 happened, and, and then I was scrambling. And I remember my brother telling me, we can't afford to do it this year. And I said, you know what? It's okay, because it, we can, because it'll, it'll come back to us. It always does, and sure as heck it did. You know, we, we were just fine. Wow. We, got, we got the money we needed. I mean, it wasn't as dramatic as kids with orphans with empty plates. It was, it was an empty checkbook. But, right. it, but, it, but the dynamic is there. I can't wait to read this, 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 this read up on this gentleman you're talking about. That's an awesome story. So anyway, yeah. back, to, back to your story. Yeah, so George Mueller, I thought, what would he do if he found himself $2.5 million in debt? Well, he didn't believe in debt. So he wouldn't have been. But if he would have been that far in debt, I think he would have just begun to give generously. And like you, I think he would have continued to, uh, you know, to donate the money he did have and to give the resources he did have. So I told my two friends who were urging me to declare bankruptcy that I was going to begin to give my way out of debt. I still had some income trickling in from the residential uh, website I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And I still had an occasional, you know, sale of property. We were still flipping homes. And so I said, well, I'm going to use my home equity line of credit, uh, which is not a really smart thing to do, maybe in this situation. And I'm going to use any resource I have. And we're going to start giving as if we were making half a million dollars a year, because that's what I need to make to get out of this. Uh, I need to do better than that even. But anyway, we began to give. I told my family January 1st, 2008, this is going to be a disaster on paper, or it's going to be a miracle. Let's see what happens. And so we began to give every single week. We gave to uh, charities, to nonprofits, foundations, uh, things we were really passionate about. And um, th- four weeks later, I think to the day, um, I was meeting with a guy at a Subway restaurant at Smith Mountain Lake. And this was a real estate developer. And he made an offhanded comment about how to uh, subdivide lots that were not really subdividable using an obscure law in the uh, county tax code. And he said, but that wouldn't work for you because of this. And a light bulb went off, and I thought, wait a minute, that might work, and here's why. So two days later, I I wasn't willing to do anything illegal or unethical or under the table, so I met with the county planning and zoning person, She looked at me over her glasses with her mouth hanging open, said, no one has ever used our law to do exactly what the intent of the law was meant to prohibit. But you're right. You can do this, and I will allow you to do it, and my hat's off to you for figuring this out. We need to close this loophole. Well, anyway, um, 13 months later, um, after a whole lot of other effort and a lot of hassle and haggling with the banks and... Uh, finding five buyers, I was able to subdivide this land and found myself not only debt free, but we even paid off my personal residence uh, 13 months later. Wow. So, wow. And you attribute it to, to giving. You know, Rod, I, I did a lot of hard work, but I tell you, if I don't think there's any chance that would have happened if I hadn't started by making a commitment and following through on that commitment to give. And we've done that ever since. No, I, I love it. I love it. In 08, I started taking um, donations for the Tiny Hands Foundation. I still cover pretty much all the operational costs. But it's uh, those of you listening, you know, you've heard my you've heard my driving force success clips. If you haven't listened to them, there's one about success versus fulfillment, and Tony Tony Robbins talks about the science of achievement and the art of fulfillment. And if you're not fulfilled, you can be a billionaire. And there are billionaires that aren't fulfilled. Um, right. and, and you're just not happy. And, and frankly, most people, most people become fulfilled by giving back. I mean, lots of ways. It's different for different people. But, but that's, that's a surefire way to feel fantastic is, is to give. And you know, even if, if you don't have the money, if you're young and you're listening to this and you're, you know, you're hell-bent on getting the Lamborghini or having the success or whatever it is that drives you, please listen. Be sure that you incorporate giving back into your, into your life, even if it's just being nice to 
to deciding to be extra nice to people today, smiling at everybody you meet today, doing a little something for somebody, it adds richness to your life. That's much, much more valuable and much, much more important than your likely definition of success. So take it from Paul and from myself. That's truly what life is about. Well, that's an incredible story, Paul. I, You know, when you mentioned that you got your way out of debt prior to turning the recorder on through giving, I didn't realize that's truly what you meant. That's, right. a, that's, that's quite a story. For those of you listening, Paul's got a fantastic book. It's called The Perfect Investment Book. What's the book about, Paul? Yeah, it's called The Perfect Investment, Create Enduring Wealth from the Historic Shift to Multifamily Housing. Like I mentioned, we built that multifamily facility and it went really well. Uh, then the Hyatt did not go so well. We right. flipped a few more homes in the meantime and I was turning 50. And I was thinking, you know, um, I've had some successes. I've had some failures. I've lost a lot of money, made some money. Um, and I thought, what would I like to do the rest of my life? I was looking for something that was safe, stable, evergreen, predictable, had nothing to do with uh, the latest technological breakthrough, the mood on Wall Street, the war in the Middle East. And I, I was basically looking for a perfect investment rod, something with uh, demographic trends that would last over the rest of my lifetime and likely through my children's. Now, that's a pretty tall order, but I was able to find that in multifamily investing, and um, I, uh, that's why I wrote the book. I really wanted people to know that the, the demographic uh, trends in the U.S. and the other economic factors, including the um, significant drop in home ownership over these last 11 and a half years, yep. uh, all that has just contributed to making this uh, multifamily, large-scale multifamily investing what I call the perfect investment. I, I agree completely. There's so many factors that are contributing to this. The fact that home ownership is at the lowest level. It's, in fact, I think for the first time in history, renters outnumber homeowners. The millennials, they don't want to buy. They, they'd rather be mobile. There's always been a huge need for affordable housing, and it will continue forever. You're absolutely right. And although we are at the top of a cycle, with the interest rates as fantastic as they are right now, there are still lots of opportunities out there if you're willing to hunt and find off-market deals. What else is going on for you? What's what's next for you, Paul? Well, I mean, my company company, Wellings Capital, is putting together a fund and we're pooling together investors uh, to find, uh, we're hoping to find off-market deals like you are uh, in great growing cities. We've done a whole lot of work with market selection. We have a 24 criteria we use and uh, we are looking to uh, to buy apartments, you know, 100 units and up. Um, and what I'm really excited about going back to giving again is... Um, I don't know if you've heard about human trafficking or what you've heard. I know it's uh, big in Florida and it's big in my state of Virginia and California and New York. Uh, I was surprised when I found out that if you take the combined record profits of Nike, Apple, Starbucks, and General Motors, multiply that number times two, that's the approximate annual revenues of human trafficking worldwide right now. Holy cow. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea. Holy yeah. cow. Yeah, it's stunning. It's $150 billion estimated. Wow. And um, it's, uh, I, I have seen personally uh, the tragedy of what happens when uh, a girl or a woman or a child, uh, sometimes even young men, are uh, are, are trapped in this type of cycle and, and what it does to their mind and their well-being. So my goal, uh, I guess you're probably, most listeners are familiar with Tom's shoes. You know, you buy a pair of shoes and Tom's donates another pair to a child in a third world country. Well, as a buyer of Tom's shoes, you don't have to share your shoes with that child. You know that the company is giving that pair of shoes away. And in the same way, uh, people who invest with Wellings Capital, uh, they don't have to share any of their investment returns at all with what we're doing as a company. But internally as a company, we're taking a significant amount of our profits and we're investing it in thwarting human trafficking and rescuing its victims. We really want these victims to know there are people who care about them, that they're not a piece of junk, and that they can have life again. And so we're investing in two or three organizations, and we also are working with our investors to allow them to direct us and tell us, hey, I really like this other organization that's drilling water wells in Africa or whatever, and we'll invest with them uh, at the direction of our investors as well. So that's what I'm really excited about, Rod. 
No, wow, I love it. I love it. Any successful organization, in my opinion, that's sustainable reinvests in the community, and you're taking a worldwide approach, which is which is very admirable. And based on your history, proven track record with giving back. Fantastic what you're doing, Paul. Love, Thanks, love, love, love hearing it. Yeah, absolutely love hearing it. You are targeting some market. You're putting a fund together, uh, as am I, and which is fantastic. Uh, there's some great opportunities out there. Tell, tell me about the markets that you're interested in, uh, if, if, you, if you've identified any yet, or are you just in the, the looking stage? Yeah, we really like a lot of the same markets most okay. other people do right now, which would be, you know, Dallas, San Antonio. Right. Uh, we still like Houston, even though the oil has, you know, um, hurt it a little bit, but not as much as in past uh, uh, downturns. Um, yeah. We like, uh, we really like the 85 corridor, which is Raleigh, Durham, Charlotte, Greenville, and Atlanta. Uh, we like uh, places like Birmingham, uh, Huntsville, Alabama, uh, Richmond, Virginia. Uh, we, we're basically looking for markets where there's a net population migration. Uh, an increase of one and a half percent or more in population per year, a diverse economy, hopefully including uh, health care, government and education jobs. Uh, we're looking for places with low unemployment rates and uh, just generally a place where people with middle to higher incomes are moving. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's same, same. I love it. No, those are those are fantastic markets. Every one of the ones you just identified are fantastic markets right now, and so that's great. You've done your homework. How can people reach you, Paul? They can reach me at my website, which is Wellings, W-E-L-L-I-N-G-S. That's wellingscapital.com. Okay. And uh, my email is paul at wellingscapital.com. And uh, I also, uh, we have our book on Amazon, The Perfect Investment. And uh, we also have a podcast uh, that we'd love to have you on if you're willing to come. It's called How to Lose Money. It's a wealth building podcast. That's an awesome name. <laughs> yeah, basically we're trying to take, uh, we're trying to interview successful entrepreneurs, investors, and business people who have had failures in their past. And I haven't found anyone yet who hasn't sure. and uh, we're trying to learn life lessons and stand on we're allowing our listeners to stand on our shoulders and hopefully not replicate the same mistakes Paul you've added a ton of value today very very grateful for having you on the show you know I hope we can stay in touch and check out his podcast check out his book Wellings Capital but let me ask you something Paul that that you're definitely a person I want to ask this question to all right you know I, I do these little clips on my show about uh, the psychology of success and and I call them your driving for success tips I always like to ask the question of, of people like yourself that are very motivating and inspired what makes you jump out of bed in the morning your reason for wanting to be so successful and continue to be successful that's a great question Rod you know when I, when I fancied myself semi-retired at age 36. Um, I was dying inside and I was actually lying to myself and others about how busy I was and uh, I wasn't at all. And uh, now I'm in my mid-50s and have absolutely no desire to retire at all because, um, Rod, I've been to Haiti and I've, I've held orphans in my arms and I've been to um, uh, other places in the world like Nepal and India and um, I've, uh, I've seen the, the pain in the world. I've seen the pain of one of my own family members who was uh, physically uh, and emotionally abused by somebody in, in a past life. And I really want to change the world. And uh, so it's, it's, it's really not enough for me to say, hey, we're going to buy a couple of apartment buildings and be financially secure for the rest of our lives. I want to plow a billion dollars uh, not just from our profits, but from the relationships and the network I make into impacting the world in a meaningful way. And I can't really give a better answer than that. No, that's a that's a very powerful, powerful response. Love it. Absolutely love it. Rod, I, I, don't, Rod, I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I, just, I just feel like I should do this. Um, my uh, company, Wellings Capital, is passionate about all kinds of things. And I, I've been to your website. I've seen the videos on Tiny Hands Foundation. Uh, we would love to match any listeners that you can earmark and just email me and uh, any of their donations in basically a given time period that you set up. Uh, we'd like to match up to a collective donation amount of uh, up to $2,000. So if we wow. can do that, we'd be honored to do that, Rod. Wow, that's very, very kind of you. I, I 
that's very, I love it, and that's so. I'm very grateful for for that for that incredible gesture. So yeah, I'll uh, I'll uh, definitely let my listeners know um, when we air this episode and uh, put a time frame on it. Yeah, we just we just got. Uh, we just we just got the coolest letter today from a third grade class. It's it's on my desk here, and it and this class this class raised three hundred dollars, three hundred twenty dollars by building something and selling it. And I've got I've got signatures in different colored ink from all these little kids in this third grade class, and they, they sent it to to the Tiny Hands Foundation. Thank thank you so wow. much for your for your generous offer, Paul. That's that's awesome, and I'm very grateful for that. Uh, so uh, for those yeah. of you that don't know what I do with the Tiny Hands, we. Um, we fed over. I think we're pushing fifty thousand children for the holidays. We've done thousands of backpacks filled with school supplies um, for uh, you know local children uh, that that don't have basic school supplies, which is just astounding to me. And then we've given thousands of teddy bears to the local police departments for the officers to keep in their vehicles to give to a child that's encountered a traumatic experience. And frankly, it's my life's greatest joy. But that said, don't let the scale of that intimidate you from doing something. Do anything to help other people and small things go talk to an elderly person in an old folks home and and, and help them spark memories do you know so many things you can do that don't cost anything Th- listen paul thank you so much for being on my show uh you've uh, been a real treat i'm really grateful for your for your very generous offer for my foundation and i'm excited to see where where, where you end up let's definitely stay in touch oh it's an honor it's been a real pleasure thanks so much rod absolutely all right take care Thank you for listening to the Lifetime Cash Flow through Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you've enjoyed the show, please subscribe and then take a moment to visit iTunes and leave a five star rating and review. For more resources to connect with us further, please visit our website at lifetimecashflowpodcast.com. Tune in next week for our next show.